Hey guys, I'm Bob. Got Jimmy Duresta here. Say hi, Jimmy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming along. Can't see who's there. This is Woody. He'll bark if I put him down. That's why I got to hold him. Oh, that's cool. So, um, anybody that's watching, we had some technical difficulty with the hangout that we were in, so hopefully people will move over here. And um, if you know anybody that was wanting to watch this and is not here, send them a message with a link to this real quick just so uh, we can get everybody moved over. And if you want to go ahead and start doing questions, um, go ahead and, and type them in there. And then um, if you if it's to both of us, just put both. If it's to one of us, you know, just start with the name so we kind of know who who they're going for. This one is probably for Jimmy. Um, oh, <laughs> so, I don't see it. Yeah, what's the best thing you found in the garbage? What's the last thing I found in the garbage? Best thing. Oh, the best thing. Uh... I actually don't have it anymore, but I, uh, I I lost it in a couple of moves about ten years ago. I had to move a few times. I had a, a roto casting machine, and I started in the street. And I was with friends, and I was like, I have to get that. And they're like, What the hell is that? What is it? it looks like a piece of garbage. It was a roto casting machine. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> what do you got? Is like a roto casting machine that takes the thing and spins it in every direction. Kind of when I was a kid in the seventies, they had a thing called the Monster Maker, which was a it basically makes a full-on rotocast. It was a machine that I think went in an oven, and all the oven was missing, so it just had this like mechanism that was hanging in space. So I mounted it, but in all my moves, I ended up leaving it in a storage unit that got uh, taken over by somebody else, and they threw it away. So, but there was a it was a machine, but I often find machines in the garbage. Actually, most recently, just reminded myself uh, a drill press, a straight-up perfect drill press. I got a call from a friend. And he said, there's a drill press on the corner of West Broadway and Houston Street. And about four hours later, I scooted over to see if it was still there, because most of these reports are really bogus. And he was 100% right. It was a tabletop drill press from, like, the 1960s. And um, I grabbed it. I put it on my Vespa and drove home with it. And that was about three months ago. Nice. So drill press, my new answer. Hmm. You use it? I use it all the time. Actually, when I was in Louisville uh, in April for two two weeks, I brought it with me. I brought a whole truck full of tools, and so I brought that drill press, and it worked out great. It worked the whole time. I didn't do anything to it except just turn it on. Wow. That's awesome. Um, let's see. These are all for Jimmy, which I totally understand and expect. <laughs> Jimmy, you've hinted before about potentially an upcoming show again with your bro, even with Matt, too. Any updates that you're allowed to talk about? Um, I have a, I, I'd rather not say who it is, but it's not with my brother and it's not with Matt, but it's with somebody really cool, and if it works out, it would be fantastic. If it doesn't happen and it's a long, dead issue, I'll tell everybody who it was, but for the moment, it would be, it's going to be a fantastic, amazing show. It's going to be a huge career boost for me, but um, if it happens, it would be fantastic. It's an altogether new uh, approach to TV, and uh, I, honestly, I personally want to include all you guys as well, you know, if it goes the way that we want it to go. Like the community that we have now, you know, and you know the community that that has taken place on YouTube in the last few years, you know, start at least for me it started two three years ago. But um, in one way or another, I would like to include YouTube uh, on this upcoming thing if at all possible. But it's a it's a big stretch, and you know, like I said, these ideas come and go constantly. Uh, there's a potential concept. And when I say any of these things don't involve networks, they only involve conceptualizing and people that are interested in taking it to a production company. So as of now, I haven't met any networks, but this other idea is like a competition show, which would be like a fun, fast competition. If anybody's my age, I'm 47, uh, you might remember a show called Beat the Clock. It's kind of a maker show similar to Beat the Clock. So those are two ideas. Um, but we'll see what happens. You know, the, the meetings are coming up quick, and hopefully fun things will come out of it. Nice. You've got a lot of uh, experience with the TV stuff, so I'm sure you know like the ins and outs of meetings and, and all that. I, honestly, you know, it's funny. I, I've had some success with TV, and it's it's extremely difficult, uh, A, to get placed inside of, uh, you know, obviously it's difficult to get placed when you're, you get your show on the air. It's like impossible odds. Um, but it's just impossible dealing with TV people. They're, they're very, very fickle, and you know, one day they're your best friend, and then the next day you just don't hear from them ever again for three years <laughs> until they get a new job, and then they need new talent, and then they go, hey, I was just wondering what you're up to. I'm like, oh, I'm still waiting for your callback from summer of 2012. <laughs> oh, this, yeah. oh, you're at a new network? Oh, great. You want to do a stupid idea? 
and then I don't call them back. So it's uh, it's tough. It's very difficult, and and uh, it's funny. I, I once asked uh, a friend of mine who's an actor, and I said, like, I'm having this difficult time with with this, that, and the other thing, and, and as far as Discovery Network goes. And he he wrote one word back. He one sentence. He just said, "Learn woodworking," <laughs> and that was that was basically his advice. To that said, nice. Have something to fall back on, which of course he knows that I do. So that was the joke. Yeah, but he just said it's it's just luck of the draw. You know, you never know what's going to happen, and you know, shows are hits by accident, and all the people involved, you know, Peacock as if they the ones that thought of it uh, to make it a hit, but they just constantly keep throwing crap at the wall, and some of them stick, and some of them don't. And it's just unfortunate that when we did Dirty Money, uh, it wasn't necessarily my lifestyle at the time, although we kind of fudged it and said that it was. When I first pitched that show in 2004, it was my lifestyle, but it wasn't. He's barking. It wasn't uh, when we eventually sold it. But um, when that show was up and running and the production was going, in the middle of shooting that show, the network had a big shake up, and everybody, as far as personnel internally, got changed. And that was the reason, in hindsight, why the show never had a second season because all the personnel that were into the show, that were championing the show, they all moved on, and the new people just weren't behind it because it wasn't their baby when, you know, from the year prior. And so that, in hindsight, that's really the reason why the show didn't take off. I mean, they, they obviously like it because they license it all around the world, so. Um, but I guess they don't like it enough to try and revive the concept. But it gets talked about all the time. Yeah, yeah. I was actually talking to some people in Atlanta this weekend that are involved in, in TV and... <clears throat> brought up a really similar thing about how, you know, people will just all of a sudden move networks and, and they they just have to change the people that they talk to and the things they're involved in for, you know, for a little while while they get settled and stuff. And then so they just kind of drag people along and they don't communicate for a while and then they do. And yeah, so. I, can, I can totally understand. But, I mean, uh, at this point in my, my, I guess you can call it my TV career, if you can call it that at all, uh, I totally know that it's all just one big crapshoot. And uh, even though I just seemed excited about this other project that potentially could happen, um, but I know enough to know that it could all just fade away. You know, even though there's phone calls and meetings being set up, it, it could all just fade away, and that's fine. It's just, at least I'm, I'm getting a little traction. I'm in the game, and uh, the most rewarding thing in all of my so-called TV career has been, my, has been my YouTube channel because it's all just me. And I'm getting direct feedback from people, and you know, almost 100% of it is good, and uh, that's been really the most rewarding thing. And, and and that also helps me tremendously when I do have TV show pitches that don't go anywhere, or when I'm in a TV meeting, because it doesn't matter to me because I know that I have my YouTube channel and I have my YouTube fans, and, and that's really the most important thing. Yeah, there's a there's one here um, from Seth actually that has to do with that. Jimmy, has your association with Make increased your reach to what you've been able to build or create, or even getting new clients because of it. Oh, Make! Uh, when I met Make, I had like 300 subscribers, <laughs> uh, maybe a thousand, maybe literally. And uh, I was making these movies, and I knew that I was going to really have to keep swinging and uh, you know be consistent and just keep. I just started seeing, I started researching YouTube and just looking at channels that I liked, like Mateus and uh, you know Steve Ramsey and. And channels that just hammer at home every couple of days and, and always consistently. I mean, I like Chucky 2009. He's a welder. So I'm always, uh, I was, I knew that I would have to make a lot of videos. So I started my, my relationship with Make right after the TV show. And the funny quick story is my license plate says I make in my New York State license plate. And the husband of one of the managing directors at Make saw that on the TV show. And they said, oh, this guy's license plate says make. We have to call him. So they tweeted me and invited me to the Make Affair in New York. And from the minute I met everybody at Make Magazine, we've been instant friends. Just like everybody on YouTube. You know, if we make stuff together and we compliment each other, let's be friends. And that's what it was like with Make Magazine and the personnel there. They've all been super nice to me. So I started making my YouTube movies, and then uh, they invited me to make them for them. That's really how it started. And they've been great. Instantly, my subscriber base started climbing because of them. So how do you, this is for me, not from the questions, but how do you balance, like, your, uh, what projects you put where? You know, is there, is there, like, a strategy to that, or is it just kind of, like, the next thing is scheduled to go to make, and the next thing is scheduled to go to your channel, or? Um, I started putting longer movies on my channel. Um, now it's just, 
if it's a little bit edgier and a little bit more technically involved, it goes on my channel. If it's a little bit more simple and family friendly, it goes on Make's channel. Like the doghouse is going to be for Make, and the Bell, which was a completely unplanned movie, which uh, ended up coming out. In my opinion, I really uh, enjoyed it. Um, it was very rewarding. The Bell. I went into a hardware store and. They said they don't make bell. They don't sell bells, and I was like, "Where am I going to get a bell?" Then I went into an antique shop, and they don't have a bell. So when I walked out, the little voice in my head said, "Why don't you just make one, stupid?" And so I went home and I started experimenting and filming my experiment. If, if it didn't work, I just would just throw the footage away or just not use it. Um, use it in a montage. If I, I, every day, also every week, I keep planning on making a montage commercial video, which is coming up one of these days with all my footage. So um, when I ended up with the bell, I thought it would be a good. Uh, coupling of putting the bell on my channel and then tomorrow the doghouse is going to be on Make's channel. And I use the bell in the bell tower of the school house doghouse. Right. Awesome. All right, let's take some more here. Um, it's from David Picciuto. Jimmy, if I want to get started in metalwork, table legs, where should I start as far as machinery? Uh, buy a $300 Lincoln welder from Home Depot with a flux core wire and get just start experimenting on chunks of metal. That's the best thing to do. Buy some re rebar at Home Depot. Uh, you could buy the new flux core welder from Home Depot, or just buy a used one on Craigslist, which is where. <laughs> Shut up. Which is where I go all the time. I go on Craigslist and get good used stuff constantly. Even though I have, like, I'll look on Craigslist, and if there's a good welder, and you know, when I feel that, like I start sweating a little bit, I know I have to get it. I make the phone call, I break the ice, and I go and I get it. Welders nowadays, on uh, unless it's a really big like multi-use one, they're only a couple hundred dollars. So just get a welder and start welding anything, weld nuts and bolts together, and eventually you start to get the hang of it. That's something I need to do too. Um, all right, Jimmy, my eight-year-old watched all your videos with me. He really wants to know if you still have the machete or if you sold it. He loved it. Oh, I, I keep everything. I'm a little bit of a sentimental freak. I, I keep everything, even. I even keep like cutoffs and pieces of things. Um, and actually, a big fan of mine, uh, a, a young kid named Julian, came to visit from uh, Nova Scotia with his mother recently, and I gave him the little piece of the machete wood cutout, the the opposite shape of the handle. I gave it that, gave that to him, and he was so excited. But uh, I save little bits and pieces of everything. I, I need something to show at Make a Fair if I'm going to go in September, so I think I'm going to actually put together like a little museum of all the various things that I made for movies that I still have. A lot of them are obviously client work, but some of the more interesting, fun little things like the machete and stuff, I keep I keep it all. Even the even the New York City birdhouse, which I planned on putting upstate in, uh, under my porch, my girlfriend said, don't, it's going to get ruined, leave it down here. So she's mm. right. So I have this in my shop right now. Uh, eventually, you know, maybe I could put it on display somewhere. Nice. All right, um, Jimmy. What prompted you to put your name on everything? I know the answer to this, but what you know on your project? Uh, it's funny. <laughs> well, the original answer was when I first got my shop. I'm in the Lower East Side, and uh, when I first moved to this neighborhood 21 years ago, things were constantly being stolen. So that just forced me and my brother to put our names on everything. My older brother, not John. My older brother Joey moved into the city with me. We lived in a two bedroom, and we had our shop right beneath us. Uh, my very first shop in the 90s. And we wrote our name on everything because we knew if somebody kicked the door into our shop, which was street level, everything would be gone in 10 minutes. <laughs> and then at least this way we had the, a so-called debris field to at least start to track our items because the people that would steal stuff from us wouldn't know who we were when we went back to try and shop and buy the stuff from the stolen goods. So um, that was the main reason. But now I do it to brand myself. I, I personally don't like credits on videos. And when I started doing my videos, I, I kind of – I always uh, – put a little credit on it, and I don't like dating videos either because I hate going back to a video and it says, you know, copyright 2012. It looks like stale bread to me, so I want people all around the world to find my videos and think they're fresh, that they were just posted. I mean, aside from the date on the posted date. Um, so that's another reason why my name appears on all my tools now. That's the most important reason is that the video is branded throughout. No one's going to blur out my name in the corner of the video or crop it tighter to crop out my moniker in the corner. My name is on the tools. It's on. It's spray-painted surreptitiously throughout the video. It's on my hat. Thank you, David Cornwell from Detroit for this hat. Um, so I just, it's just branding. That's all. 
That's all it is. And it's and it, and it, you know I'm sticking my finger in the eye of the people that don't like it. So. <laughs> No, I mean it's a great it's it's a great card that you're using. You know, obviously it's working out for you. Everybody, thank you, the rest of, So, um, all right, Jimmy, I know you went to a design school. Uh, do you feel like a lot of your creativity comes from your schooling, or did schooling just help you make your ideas into reality? Uh, that's a good question. I, I was obviously quite. Uh, I was very creative growing up my whole life, and I I credit my dad with putting tools in my hands at an early age. He bought me a set of chisels. I didn't know what to do with them until I started making guitars. He literally put those in front of me. Ten years after he put them in front of me is when I really started to really, really use them. But uh, when I got to art school, I started to really get a focus. I started to really see, oh, I could do this and make money. Before that, I was just like fiddling around, making signs here and there. Nothing seemed to be quite as fulfilling as when I had to create an assignment, and I did it well, and I did something I was very proud of. And so that really gave me a sense of pride in what I do is uh, fulfilling the homeworks throughout my school years. And and one of the most important things, and I teach at the school now for 20 years, the most important thing that school is for, besides all that, is making connections and making friends and getting inspiration from fellow students. So I have students that sometimes want to drop out and they come to me and I say, you got to stay in school because you're, you're growing with a group of people that will just help pull you along. So that's that was another really big important thing. It's just the group of people I worked with. Um, did, it was at SVA. Is that where you? School, yeah, School of Visual Arts. I still teach there. I teach during the regular school year, twelve to three on Fridays. If anybody's ever on Twenty First Street, you can come visit my class. Nice. Just the, I, I I went to art school in Savannah, and oh, at SVA. Yeah, it's good. And there was actually at one point an SVA in Savannah. That was That's what I was going to say. You guys, I know you guys are like, uh, you guys throw eggs at each other, right? I, well, actually, I was friends with a bunch of SBA people, and when they had to leave, because the school left town, that was yeah. kind of a bummer for all of us. But. They got sued, and there was some kind of lawsuit somehow. I don't know what, I really don't know exactly what it was, but some of my students were involved in, uh, you know, the legal witness. I don't even know what the hell it was, but it was a, a lawsuit over copyrights or, you know, who came to town first or something stupid. Yeah. But SBA yeah. ultimately had to leave. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it was it was pretty stupid. Anyway, uh, Jimmy, what's one tool you can't live without? And if you could only have five tools, what would they be? <laughs> well, I've answered this before for Scott Meeks, but um, a bandsaw is obviously the one thing I like the most because I feel like I could really make anything. You know, if I was stranded and all I had was my bandsaw, I could pretty much do everything with the bandsaw. And um, uh, lately, I like my low angle block plane. That's a lot of fun. I've been using that for a few years now. Um, uh, table saw is obviously extremely important. So with a bands on a table saw, a screw gun, and a nail gun, you can pretty much get anything done. And of course, a hammer. And if you have hammer and nails, you can pretty much do anything as well. I figured you'd just say your Leatherman, which you had that. Uh, of course my Leatherman. I, there's so much shit floating around in my brain, it's hard to focus. But yeah, uh, Leatherman, absolutely. I got like 25 Leatherman. I actually wrote to them a couple times and said, hey, if you guys ever want any, like, Testimonials, all the various ways you could break it. You could contact me, but they never did. <laughs> I, I, I break. I got a. I got two brand new mutts. They're probably right here. I got. Here's my broken mutt right here, and then on my belt is my brand new mutt. I like the mutts lately because I use this little pry bar at the end a lot. Um, but these are like 160 bucks each. You know, this one. I don't know. It just broke. It doesn't stay into the plier position anymore. I don't Those things are huge. Um, how is your dog? This is Woody. He's totally blind. He's 13 years old, and he's a little bitch. He doesn't stop whining. Um, if I put him down right now, he wants to eat. So if I put him down, he's going to stop barking. Uh, Lucky's doing really good. Lucky's getting old. Lucky's about 12 years old. Lucky was on Hammered a few times. That was when I first got him. My neighbor went in the hospital, and uh, she passed away. And while she was in the hospital, I, I, I hung on to him. She was elderly, so uh, it wasn't unexpected that she wasn't going to make it back. And so I ended up keeping him. I had him since 2007. This guy I've had since he was a puppy. And then recently, uh, we got Bear. You can't see Bear. He's on the floor down here. He's a big black Labrador. We got him last year in Chattanooga, Tennessee, driving through. We got him at a flea market. Nice. <laughs> it was a false spot. Uh, okay, here's another one. Jimmy, how in the world do you find anything in your shop? I'm curious about that, too. I would actually love to see, this is not what they asked, but I would love to see a tour of your shop because it seems like 
an endless maze of small rooms. It is. I jokingly say it's like being inside of a, an Egyptian tomb because it is, it's, it's two tenement buildings connected together, and one has a wood floor, so those neighbors are constantly yelling at me for making noise, and the other one has a concrete vaulted ceiling, and the concrete vaulted ceiling is the one that I film in most often because the neighbors upstairs don't complain about noise. They only complain the minute I open a paint can so that, or spray paint. They immediately... So we have a front room, which is underneath the hair salon, and they don't care. They're a bunch of cool girls that could care less about anything except cut hair, and uh, they seem to like me. So if I make smells, they don't care. If I make grinding, so spray painting, painting, and grinding all happens in the front front room because grinding is a little too ear piercing to do in the back. Um, it's awesome. I, I find stuff. I know where everything is. <laughs> I I find things that that I placed ten years ago. It's uh. It's, I know where everything is, like, and, and it's like I got a gut feeling. I'm like, okay, over here is that horn that I took off a bicycle that I found in the street. It's somewhere in this part of the room. And yeah. uh, uh, even my assistant's been with me for seven or eight years. He knows where everything is, too. So uh, he knows when we clean up, you know, to kind of keep things in the, the messy chaos that, that it is. You know, it's like organized chaos. So do you, do you actually remember it? Like, do you organize things, or do you just remember where it is? No, I, I mean, I, I have organized... I just remember where everything is. Like, if I decide a new drawer, like the few people that work at my shop, like, will open an empty drawer and they're like, "Where the hell's all the, you know, the the compasses?" And I'm like, "Oh, I moved them over to here." But there's no real rhyme or reason. I'm a big fan of Casey Neistat's videos. Do you know Casey Neistat? Mm -hmm. He's he's a fantastic filmmaker, and and I I think he's awesome. I would love to be friends with him one day. Casey just did a video called uh, "How to Organize," and he's like obsessive compulsive, like organizing freak. So he did a really funny video about how to organize a shop. And I looked at that and that's just too it's too crazy for me. I could never do what he does. But I do have a loose system based on what he does in his video. It's like things that are similar always go in the same area. And then some things are more similar than others and then that, that circle gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's how the whole room gets filled with junk. Hmm. Adam fun. Savage has a few like that too on uh, tested on on that site. Where oh, he yeah, walks yeah. through his shop and he talks about how he organizes things and how he keeps track of where everything is. I mean, he has a ridiculous amount of stuff too. So, yeah, my spot is small. I'm actually I broke ground a couple weeks ago. I have 40 acres in upstate New York, and the reason I bought it 10 years ago was specifically to build a new shop. And I got roped into restoring the house, and now the house is it's not totally restored, but a lot of the rooms are restored. The kitchen's new. Uh, some of the people who follow me on social media noticed I did my kitchen over. So anyway, so I broke ground in the back, and I'm going to try and build like a 2,500 square foot garage with two levels. And so I've been working on concepts. But I'm excited about that, but that won't happen. You think that that'll be your full time shop? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Nice. But it's going to take time and money. And yeah. Um, let's see. Jimmy, do you edit your own videos? Yes, I do. In the beginning, David, my assistant, edited a couple, and that was just because I was kind of feeling the flow out, and I just said, you know what, you edit some, I'll edit some, and he would take them home and do them himself. And uh, but now, just to keep consistent, because you know, at the end of the day, it's just me. Um, if I feel the impulse to make a video on anything in the middle of a, a regular work schedule, I jump right into it. David's my assistant, uh, but sometimes he's not around. He, he actually lives most of the time in, in Syracuse, New York lately, so sometimes he's around, he'll check in with me, and I'll say, you know, we have a big job coming up, and then he'll stay in New York for a couple weeks, so uh, I find myself making movies almost always alone. Occasionally, my girlfriend holds the camera, but about 99% of the time, I make my videos alone by myself, edit myself. It always kind of catches me off guard when I, um, I like... You're you're doing something, and all of a sudden the camera starts moving while you're working. I'm like, whoa! There's somebody else in there. <laughs> well, you know what? I kind of like this interesting style, and you'll see it in the upcoming doghouse video. It's in every one of my videos. I I have this technique where I'm getting feedback. I don't know if you have a couple of windows open here. No. All right. Anyway, I I will be in the middle of shooting the scene. And to me, I know that it's boring because it's already been too long. So I just take the camera and I move it to another position. But when I speed it up, it looks like a transition that it's just ahead. So I just leave it in. So a lot of times you see the camera jump around. And then I'm just picking the camera up and making a new camera angle. That's all it is. But I leave in where I pick and move the camera up, which to me, I think looks cool. So it's another little, little signature technique that I play around. 
it happened by accident. I just thought it. I always thought that I would just. If it's the same piece of footage, where I have the camera here and then I pick it up and move it there, I would just cut out those few seconds that where the camera moves. But now I leave it in. Just to hmm. it looks cool. I am losing some of your audio, so I don't know if you're hearing mine or not. But I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. Um, all right. So, what's the best way to price what you make to sell in order to make a living? Uh, it all depends on the client. If I know the client's got no money, or at least a budget, when people come to me and say they want to make this reception desk, or they want to make this, or they want to make that, I say to them, this is really how I do it almost every time. I say, how much do you want to spend? And I, I judge myself. I say, when you put the question to people like that, they always say louder. They, they always say more than you would say. They, you know, they, they don't want to embarrass you, and they don't want to embarrass themselves. So I, I find it puts them in a position to say, Oh well, three uh, thousand when they really only wanted to spend two thousand. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I always ask my clients that hire me or call me for consult. I just straight away say, "How much is the budget?" Which basically means, "How much do you want to spend on that?" And they'll say, "Whatever the number is, three or four or five thousand. And I'll say, "Okay, I'll build it to suit that budget." And that that's how that happens most of. So whatever they tell me they can respond, I'll say, okay, I'll make it this way, and I'll explain that it's that, that value. And if I explain it to them and then they say, well, I want it to be steel, and, and I'll say, well, throw in another $1,000 and you can have all those bells and whistles that you want. And they'll say, okay, and so then, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, and, and for, I don't know if this question is, is um, maybe geared towards or less geared towards com like commission work, and that's mostly what you do, right? Most everything that you do and sell is commission. You don't just make stuff to sell. Yeah, I, I guess stuff maybe. around the show. Uh, when I did the show, obviously I was making stuff. Making stuff about a couple years after the show, I was still doing that. But I just get so much client work that people say, "Hey, can you make this thing?" And of course, the whiskey companies now are asking me, which is really great. They're great, great. They've been really good to me and given me a lot of work. Um, so my phone is ringing, which is which is really good. I'm happy. Um, all right. So hi guys. Question for you both. I see that you both use different types of materials in your creations. What would you say is your favorite medium to work in, and why? Oh, this is Izzy. Izzy Swan. Oh, Izzy. What's up, brother? Love your videos, man. So um, I'll answer first, and then you can. Um, well. Actually, I don't really have a good answer. Mo mostly, I use wood. I mean, I've I've used a bit of other stuff, um, but I'm definitely most comfortable with wood. Uh, doing some metal work is on my radar, and I've done it in the past, but I'm just out of practice, so I need to get back into that because it's uh, something I definitely want to to get back into. Um, and and I enjoy a lot of the extra kind of detail work, screen printing, you know, on top of whatever, and um, you know, etching and electronics works, they kind of add on to a bigger piece of wood or a bigger piece of whatever. Uh, I like that stuff, but I mostly stick in, in, in the wood realm for now. What about you? Uh, I like uh, wood, and I, of course, like metal. The reason I really like metal is because you get instant results, and it lasts forever. You know, of course, the heirloom furniture, uh, you know, really good. Joinery and stuff lasts forever, but I'm really nothing lasts forever. And that's why I'm building quite a bit. I'm still building up to my uh, my professional metal job. Hopefully, I can have it. I kind of do metal work all over the world, which will kind I still get it done. Still get it done. All right. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Jimmy, you're a stud on the bandsaw. Any close calls to speak of? Oh, uh, yeah, I've cut myself probably 15 times. I mean, this this is the most uh, visible scar right between my knuckles. I did that when I was 18. My hand hit that big space above the, uh, the guide block. My hand bumped into the blade when I was, like, grabbing something. It cut a big, giant chunk. It's a really odd spot to get caught. And uh, I was afraid to tell my dad, so I just bandaged it up, and it got a big, ugly scar. I probably needed a bunch of stitches, but I was afraid to show my father. 
he knew that I should have been using the bandsaw when I was using it. So. <laughs> but I cut, I cut it. Um, right on my thumb, I got my throat all over my hands. A lot of them are from the BAM saw. But the table saw was the worst. Right there, my pinky line. Hmm. Ooh, yeah. And I, the video keeps switching back and forth, and it's looking at me when you're talking a lot of times, so I don't know if they saw that or not. But Who's looking at me? All right, so do you have any, just for Jimmy, do you have any formal training in woodworking or metalworking, or is it all just kind of picked up? No, it's honestly, uh, I don't have any formal training. If it looks professional, I learned it on YouTube. <laughs> no, I, I just think it works for me. I must admit, you know, there's you know, a lot to learn when it comes to, uh, you know, fine woodworking. A lot of my clients don't necessarily call for that work, so I don't, I don't get that far into dovetails and complicated joinery. So, so it's I will get there eventually. Now I, I do a combination of vintage wood and steel most often, which is fun. I'm kind of losing. You might want to maybe disconnect and reconnect if you can, because I'm kind of losing audio. I don't know if maybe. How should I do that? Huh? Uh, how would I do that? Up at the top, there should be a little red um, phone thing. Yep. Yep. Phone icon. So you might try leaving that and coming back, or I'm not sure if that'll help or not. But I don't know if anybody else is having trouble hearing you, um, but I am. So yeah, maybe hit that red icon and and disconnect and see if you can reconnect to it. Everybody hang on, I'll, it might not happen right away. And Bob, Bob, if you don't see me in a minute. Okay. All right, well, i got one for me, so I'll answer this. Uh, Bob, how's the new CNC working out? Have you upgraded the router yet? No, I haven't. I actually haven't had time to do anything. Uh, I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, and I went to Inventables, and so since that trip, I've just been trying to catch up. Um, so I haven't done anything with the CNC. It's over in the corner. Yet, um, but one of the reasons that I haven't upgraded the router in it yet is because it needs new mounts to be able to hold the, the router. It's it's larger than the um, larger around than the Dremel tool, so I have to make some mounts to go on there. And the easiest way to make those mounts would be to use a 3D printer. But my 3D printer won't be here for another month or so, and then I have to learn how to use that. So I don't know yeah. when I'll actually get to uh, upgrading the CNC, but it'll happen. One of these days. Am I here? Am I here? Yep, you're here. Audio sounds better, I think. Oh, good. Oh, good. So, I still don't have, I don't have questions on the side, but, but as long as you have them. Oh, you don't have them. Oh, weird. Uh, I haven't had them. I haven't had them. Oh, gosh. Okay, well, I'm glad I'm reading them then. Um, on the uh, left side of your screen, if you mouse over there, there should be some icons that pop up. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And there's one that says Q&A, and if you see that, then you can click that, and you'll be able to see the questions as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, it should be no. below that. Q&A. Q&A. Control room. Control room. Q&A. Nice. Okay, it's loading. Okay, it's loading. It's loading. Oh, there right, so, Thank you, everybody. Uh, Jimmy, what's a skill you've always wanted to learn but you haven't done yet? Um... I want to get really good at cleaning and using a milling machine. When you see me just moving around on laying up, I'm really just just figuring it out. Uh, my CNC machine is a great, great learning curve that I got last May. I got a shop bot. You've seen some of them in my videos. To me, that's been a huge hurdle. So that kind of my formula into cleaning. I've been machining a lot of. Uh, Metal. In fact, I only missed this because I was so wrapped up. I'll show you a picture of something I'm in. I'm seeing, seeing uh, this metal pipe. So I was so wrapped up, I almost forgot to come here for this. <laughs> trying to figure out why they. Think of it right now. I don't know. I'd like to be able to make anything. I want to make a chopper like Jesse James. I just haven't had the space to do that. 
you know, when you see what Jesse James does with blacksmithing, I want to get there and there. Yeah, I can see blacksmithing being something right up your alley. Seems like you'd be. Seems like you would have already have some of the skills needed for that as well. But yeah, I just need the facilities. I almost. This week, I have a friend at the studio in New York City, and I almost got my hands on the little giant. But they decided to keep it. That's a giant power hammer. I would have had to put that up. I'll get one. I'll get one. Um, yeah, it sounds like there's still an issue with your audio. I don't know. I, I don't know if we can do anything about it, but... Um, do you guys plan to do lathe work? Uh, for me, personally, I have a lathe, and I've touched it twice, so I do plan on it, but I am no good at it yet. Um, I haven't, you know, had any experience, and I don't really have anybody around that um, knows how to, to use it well, so I'm not sure. I'm just going to have to figure it out and watch YouTube videos. <laughs> so... Yeah. That's you do a, a lot of lathe work, right? I do, I do. I, I stay away from it a little bit on the video. Just because it's, I find, I mean, I know I just did a bell video. Which, I mean, it was a way to make it fresh. But a lot of wood learning stuff, to me, just visually looks the same. Um, you know, but so, I mean, when Frank does something great, uh, you know, uh, from forward, uh, he's got beautiful skills and uh, beautiful video skills as well. Um, I'm getting a, I'm getting a freak out. Can you hear me? Every time I speak, I speak. No, yeah, it's coming. See, see if you can turn your speakers down. Somebody said it might be uh, your speakers. Could be Is that hard? feedback. I still hear myself lower and lower. Um, but like I said, the reason I stay away from bowl making and that kind of stuff, because honestly, there are guys that do much more beautiful pieces than I could ever do. If I did a bowl or anything like that, it would have to be some kind of unique, inventive thing, as opposed to just like a beautiful segmented bowl, which guys do incredibly beautiful. Um, you know, all the ones I've seen, really well done. All right, uh, let's see. My volume is too high. It's feeding back through me. Okay. Well, I just changed my microphone, so hopefully it'll be better. Sure. Um, a lot of messages on here about the audio. <laughs> well, now right. I don't uh, Bob, do you plan on doing some videos on basic electronics, testing, repair, mainly be project videos? Um, for me, it'll probably mostly be project videos. I don't have a lot of experience with like, uh, you know, figuring like problem, like troubleshooting electronics. It's more just ground up uh, building something that I'm interested in having. So, do you do? Uh, do you do Bob? Do you do? Um... Uh, Arduino and you know, Adafruit and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've done a couple Arduino projects and some Raspberry Pi. I built a, uh, or am building, an arcade machine out of a Raspberry Pi. So it's going to be like a full-size arcade cabinet. Um, I'm and, trying to get a light on you, sorry. Yeah, um, I've done a couple Arduino uh, projects, and I have another one coming up that I've just started uh, working on that will hopefully be a project video. Oh, cool. I, uh, I've experimented with an Arduino. I bought an Arduino a couple years ago at Maker Faire, and I went through the book, and I made the blinking light and all that stuff just to kind of break my virginity. And uh, I know enough to know that when I need it, I'm going to dig into it. So it's, uh, it's interesting. It's interesting, uh, complicated, yet simple. But you know, there's a lot to know. And With me, I always know that the technology is there, and when I need it desperately, I dig into it. And I know that one day I'll get back into it. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way as far as that. Oh, it says audio is fixed, so maybe we fixed it. Good. Oh, good. Thank you. All right. Um, let's see. Most of these are about the audio. <laughs> Which is your favorite? Metalworking, woodworking, wood carving, sculpting, lathe work, or welding? Um... I love making things out of wood, obviously, simply because it's uh, it's accessible and it happens fast. Uh, but I, I really do. I'm getting increasingly more interested in doing metal work. One of these days, when I have the facilities, I'll do metal casting. My girlfriend makes uh, steel furniture, and that's TaylorForest.com. If you do a Google search on Taylor Forest, F O R R E S T, you'll see some of her work. But Taylor is uh, she's really expanding my interest in in metal work by being extremely curious about how to make her chairs more efficiently and more quickly. And even just tonight we were talking about having her cast her chairs in bronze, which would be awesome. And uh, she's 
she's really good at sourcing things and sourcing technologies. So she has a, a guy in upstate New York that's going to experiment with helping her make molds of her chairs. So that kind of stuff is really, really uh, exciting to me. Awesome. Um, I mean, for me, I, I, I don't do any carving. Um, I haven't done sculpture in a really long time, and I'm, I haven't done enough of the other ones, so I guess I'm stuck with woodwork. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, electronics and, and, you know, like... Um, Plastic molding and stuff like that. I'm really interested in. in um, yeah, I think of woodworking as very subtractive. You know, it's it's you you're just cutting down. But I'm really interested in, in more additive things like molding and and you know bending plastics and stuff like that. So it's just something I haven't had enough time to really get into. But um, yeah, I'd like to think like the way my the way my my thinking typically goes is. If I know that I could do this technology, whether it's sculpting, carving, or creating a silicone mold, and if something is similar to it, I know that I could at least make that, that leap. It's almost like jumping from one lily pad to another. So when I know that I'm comfortable with this technology and that other technology is similar, um, there's just a few little things to learn. I'll go on YouTube. I'll, the Complete Sculptor here in New York City is, a, is an excellent resource, and Mark is the owner. Mark knows everything and everybody about a lot of these technologies. Uh, Sculpting metal work, metal patina, uh, clays. So uh, I always pick Mark's brain when I need to try and breach something new. Um, so it's just a matter of just asking questions and really, honestly, looking on YouTube. Is this if there's anything that's ever been thought of or done, somebody filmed themselves doing it, which is the beauty of being alive today. Yeah, I totally agree. I've learned a ridiculous amount of stuff that I wouldn't have ever thought I needed to know otherwise, but once yeah. you learn it, you see it out there. You're like, oh yeah, that's, that's helps me in some way. Um, I've heard a rumor about the two of you doing a collab. Is this true? And when will this happen? Oh, it's David. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I owe you guys an email. You guys emailed me when I was in Kentucky. Uh, I recently went to Southeastern Kentucky University, Technical University, to help them with a project. They were doing sort of a little local project to try and inspire creativity, and that's when you guys email me, and I just said, oh, I'll get to you guys later, and of course, the project kind of took my, took up the few days I was there, and I and I just knew that I'd get back to you, but um, yes, let's do something. Dave, I like your idea. <laughs> this is me answering your email. <laughs> let's do it. Thank yeah, you. I think the last idea that was going around is probably where we should go, so. Yeah, we're going to do something for sure, and it's going to be cool as hell, so I, I think it'll be fun. Just all of a sudden, we end up with like nine. When I, once I dug into it, I'm like, oh, wow, we're going to end up with nine different parts of this. It's going to get complicated really quick. It's like yeah. something to try and wrap your head around. Yeah, so we have that coming. Um, for both of us, do you make plans, drawings of your projects before you make it? Um, I typically just do a quick sketch, and I happen to have my sketchbook nearby. Let me see if there's anything in it. Uh, I do quick sketches. So there's some sketches of my of my upcoming barn, which I haven't built yet, but I want to. Um, I do a couple of small sketches. Sometimes I just scribble like this for hours on end, which means nothing, but out of it comes something. And uh, I'm going to do a backpack video, and these are my these are my concept sketches for my backpack video. But the way I'm going to make it is going to be a little is going to be a little different. But I won't really do more than that. I don't really have the patience for SketchUp or any of that stuff, although I do do it, um, but I do it very infrequently. Uh, yeah. So I just do that, and I get most of my finalized design in the process of, of making it. You know, I realize, okay, that's not going to work. Let me try it this way. Oh, that works better. You know, so it's a little bit of a trial and error, walking in the dark kind of thing. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way. I, I have a little field notes that I carry with me all the time. And right on. It's all, um, you know, pretty... Pretty rough sketch stuff, but uh, I don't ever really get too far into plans. I mean, I have done some SketchUp plans that are available on my site, and the time I spent doing those, it felt right at the time, and then after the fact, I'm just like, man, that took twice as long as it would have just to make it. So, yeah, I, don't, I know a lot of a lot of guys on YouTube will do plans for the things and provide them for free, and it's it's awesome that they do that. But I'm finding more and more that I don't have the patience or the time. I mean, I'm just the the time I have in the shop is is uh, pretty thin anyway, so you know to add on to it, making plans is hard to justify for me. 
this is my little pocketbook that has got some notes in it. This is the one I keep, like, in my billfold. I haven't been carrying it in the last few days. But, uh, oh, look, here's my hammer hook video. There's the sketch I did for my hammer hook video right there. <laughs> That's all I did. I just drew a hammer with a hook under it. Um, and then, you know, my, my, my push stick with my name on it? All right, there's, the, there's the drawing for my push stick with my name on it. That's it right there. So, I mean, these ideas come to me real spontaneously, and I just write either a sentence or something just so I don't forget them. And then sometimes I go back to them and I look at them like this and I say, what the hell was I drawing? I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> but this, this is a video series that I want to do, and these are all shop tips. There's a few pages like this. They're all just one-sentence shop tips. And uh, I'm going to do like 30 or 40-second videos of all the shop tips that I developed either for myself or ones that have been handed down either through my dad or just friends and family. Uh, so that's a video series I want to shoot. And I'm going to shoot that coming coming soon because it's real easy. I just plan on doing just a one-take sentence and saying, hey, if you want to use epoxy this way, do this, that, and the other thing, and it'll give you these better results. So it's going to be as quick as that. So I just have to get to the getting. Yeah. Do you find that you have just uh, way more ideas than you have time as far as stuff to film? Uh, you know, it's funny. When I get down to filming, and I've obviously taken a few uh, week break from Make Magazine, and that mostly has to do with traveling because I, I had to go to – I went to New Orleans, I went to Alabama, and I went to Kentucky. And uh, in between all that, I try to shoot videos, but – I shot a video in Alabama. I just don't like it, so no one will ever see it. Um, but uh, it's tough. Sometimes I have a bunch of ideas, and when I get down to time to make a video, I don't like any of the ideas I have in my notebook. Or, you know, even though it's an idea, it's not ripe. It doesn't have all the ingredients. I don't have that cool machine to use. I don't have that good material to use. So even though I have lots and lots of ideas to make videos, sometimes I'm just not in the mood to make what I have notes of. And then I end up making a bell video, which is absolutely something spontaneously came out of nowhere. My Tangare sign was something I had absolutely no ideas that week that I was happy about or that I was grooving on. And then uh, my guys at Diageo asked me if I could make a Tangare sign. It needed to be done literally. Had, I needed time to seven-day FedEx it. So that's why it really it had a week to get to the party. But I had to get it in FedEx the next day so we could get to the party on time in New Orleans. So something like that came up, and it literally took one day to make it and make that video. And you know, so I, I always try to keep my mind open for those type of opportunities. So. Yeah, I actually had a, a similar thing to that recently. It was really frustrating. I did some work for Wild Turkey, and uh, they, it was a week to. They were going to ship me this piece of furniture, and I was going to distress it and screen print on like three panels, and then repack it up and then ship it to Chicago for them to use for this trade show. And so I did all this work in a really short amount of time and then sent it up there and it got damaged in shipping and they didn't even use it. So I... oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, it's 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 tough when you ship something. You gotta really, really make sure it's packed well. It's a it's a pain in the butt. My cousin just got a stained glass window for the second time and it's broken. The woman who made it didn't pack it well. It's really from no uh, some some somewhere in the southwest. So it's the bummer. Thing. Um, Bob, can't wait for my new shirt to arrive. Jimmy, do you have any swag? Yeah, a lot of people ask about your shirts from you and things like that. I mean, do you have any plans for that? Uh, well, it's funny. My, my buddy Dave Cornwell made me this hat. Uh, he's a Detroit police officer in Hamtramck, Michigan. And uh, he made this hat for me when he came to visit me in New York a couple weeks ago. I get a lot of shop visits, and when people come, I give them pencils. Uh, I, some people have pencils from me. Uh, I make these myself on my CNC machine, so I give out, lately I've been giving out pencils, and of course I have my my, uh, my stencil I give away, and I encourage people to make their own shirts, because I just, to me it seems like such a hassle to have to pack up a shirt and mail it. I mean, I have fan mail that I, I reply to as much fan mail as I can, this is something, but this is going to England, so I have to go wait in line at the post office with this one, but a lot of things I drop in the, uh, in the mailbox when I can, but I'm in the process of getting... Camouflage hats made that are going to say Duresta in black embroidery on them. It's going to be real tree camo with my name on the top, just like this. And uh, this was made at a mall, and and he was nice. Put the make on the back, awesome. <laughs> but it was a gift. I actually gave Dave my poker table. If anybody's ever seen the episode of Hammered where I make a poker table, mm. it was sitting around my shop. I actually got it back recently because the people I gave it to were moving, and they 
they didn't want to keep it. They wanted to give it back to me, so they gave it back to me. And David came at the right time, and so I gave it to him. He took it back to Michigan with him. And in the process, he bought me this as a thank you. But it's a... Uh, once I get the hats, that'll probably be my official swag. But all this other stuff that I see and see and I give away is, you know, is available to anybody that wants to drop me a self-addressed stamped envelope. And if anybody does want to do that, put it in an envelope this big, so I could put some cool stuff in it. Because everyone sends me the regular A4 envelopes, and they're too small to put a bunch of stuff in them. So I just put their stamps and I rewrite it. So I don't know. Nice. I'm happy to give away whatever I can. But as far as selling stuff. It's just a pain in the butt. But when I do get the hats, I'm going to have to sell them because they cost a lot of money. Yeah. And you can always look into, you know, fulfillment house type stuff. I mean, you don't make as much on it, but it is is totally a hassle. I was at the, uh, you know, at the post office today dropping off, like, 15 shirts and all the time it took to package them and ship them and all that stuff. You know, I'm yeah. grateful that I was able to sell them, but it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, and you know, my day runs really long, so... Uh... That's why I, I just give out stencils and I encourage people to make their own shirts. <laughs> That'd be awesome if they did, if they wanted to. Oh, I mean, people have done it, right? You've seen them. A couple, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a couple of cool videos of people using my logo for stuff, which is it's just amazing. And, and I'm so thankful that people are inspired to do that. It's, it's amazing to me. And I, I thank everybody that's interested. Yeah. Here's another one. Uh, do you guys ever lose the motivation to make things? And if so, how do you get out of the rut? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did this last couple of weeks. <laughs> Honestly, I drove to Kentucky, and then when I came back, I had sort of like a, a little bit of a down week. When I say down, not a lot of work. So I kind of took my time. It took me all week to build something that I should have built in one or two days. And I get to install it tomorrow, which is exciting. Um, yeah, I definitely get it. And honestly, I, I was having a down week, and I, I should have delivered a make movie sooner. But doing the bell, and I keep bringing the bell up just because for me it was like a little personal realization again. When I got into the bell, I was like, wow, it's so funny. Inspiration could happen on a dime. And then yesterday I jumped right into making my doghouse, which is in here in front of me. But um, my doghouse video is going to be up this, uh, hopefully tomorrow. My doghouse video, I'm really proud of. <laughs> this is it. This is the doghouse. It's an old schoolhouse doghouse, and the bell is in the bell tower, and it's for my boy in there, my little boy. Lucky. And the bell rings when he when he walks in, right? Yeah, and it works great. It really worked great. It's a little, it's a little tricky getting it to work for the video, but it really does work, and it works consistently now. If, if I had to rebuild it, I would build it. But, you know, when you build something, or when you build a mechanism especially, you make it one time, you play with it, and then a week later you like you go, why didn't I just do it this way? And it's a much easier way. You know, these are little breakthroughs that happen once you get into making something. And uh, if I did it again, I'm sure I would make it more simple. But in the video, you see the kind of cock the way I hooked it up with a wire. But it works. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Jimmy, you have an amazingly creative mind. How do you come up with your ideas, and do they just come to you, or any advice to others looking to be more creative? Uh, well, it's funny. I, I can just... I did a, a TEDx talk at the Solomon Westchester High School, and eventually they'll put it online. I don't know how the video came out. I didn't videotape it myself, but the conversation was about breakthroughs and happy accidents is what the title of the lecture was. And I basically say you got to feed your mind with as much sludge as you find. Uh, be curious about things. Obviously, YouTube is a great resource, but in and around your environment, look in the garbage can, I always say I go shopping in the garbage can constantly, and not necessarily for physical items, but for, for like joinery, the way things are made, the way things come together, the way zippers work on bags. Like I walk past garment bags all the time, and it's not the type of thing you could just tear apart in a store, but when you see a garment bag in a garbage, you just tear it open and look at how it's made, and then you just leave it in the garbage. So these are the type of things I encourage people to do is to just constantly look around you and see how things are made. When two things fall together, you know, be aware of what that looks like. Oh, wow, oh, that would be cool. You know, this and this together, you know, that's kind of an old art school thing, but um, combining two unusual objects, how would that work? A birdhouse that looks like a building, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's definitely part of my art school training. But I've practiced it quite a bit, and um, 
the doghouse, for instance, doing the old school doghouse. I, I started writing my blog this evening on my iPhone while I was waiting for my CNC to, to finish. Um, the blog post will go out, but I just recently drove to Kentucky and back and driving across the United States. You see all these abandoned buildings everywhere. And, it, and I was like, you know what? I got all that kind of wood in my shop from a lot of the projects that I recently did. I should make an abandoned looking building doghouse. Oh, what would an abandoned building doghouse be? Oh, oh, a schoolhouse because it's back to school. So all these little points start to gel in my mind, and then one morning I'm hugging my dog, and I'm like, boom, that's it. i got to make this little guy a doghouse. It should be a schoolhouse, fall, back to school. Oh, there should be a bell in it. Oh, the bell could be the mechanism. The bell could be the, the left turn that I'm always looking for in my videos. So these all don't happen right away, and you know sometimes you need to go away and you know just let your mind marinate on all these different visual inputs. But that's the most important thing is just to really feed your brain and your eyes with lots of garbage, literally garbage. Yeah, and I, I, I would add to that that uh, it's easy for us, like if you're a woodworker, it's easy for you to spend all your time watching woodworking videos and to just be like wrapped up in, in just that medium. But um, part, I think part of the art school thing is having being forced to use medium that you're not comfortable with and you know, uh, getting exposed to how other techniques work and stuff. And so I think if you're if you're looking at, at woodworking all the time, then you're not going to be exposed to a lot else. So uh, one way to be inspired is just to go to look at other stuff. Look at you know uh, fine artists. Look at metal workers. Look at uh, you know just anybody that does something different than what you do. Look at their techniques and look at you know what drives them to do what they do. And that stuff you can carry over, I think. Absolutely, uh, it's it's real important to just experiment too. You know, it, it, when you, I, I always experiment, and that's how I end up coming up with my breakthroughs, and that's what I call the breakthrough. Like, for instance, um, I keep using the example of the doghouse because it's the most current thing on my brain. But you know, the breakthrough uh, to put the bell on the top, you know, led to other video, led to a second video. So you know, just to make a doghouse is cool. But in all my videos, I always like to have like a little. I always call it the left turn, you know, the one thing that is like, oh, you know, like cut the knife out of an old saw, you know. It wasn't the most original idea, but um, it occurred to me that's where I'd get a good piece of steel, so, you know, and also ruffled feathers. Sometimes I like to ruffle feathers as well. Yeah, you got some negative feedback about cutting up that saw. I've never seen that. People would have, I probably would have got less feedback if I, if I like, strangled a kitten. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for both of you, what do you listen to in the shop? I know for me, I don't listen to a whole lot anymore because if I'm in the shop, I'm probably filming a video, and I don't want the background noise of the, you know, of the stereo. And uh, so, yeah, I don't listen to a whole lot in the shop anymore. What about you? Uh, I listen to Howard Stern constantly. I listen to because he's on like he loops all day long on Sirius. But I listen to Sirius radio and uh, or country music. I listen to a lot of country music. Uh, a lot of uh, classic rock, um, but I guess mostly Howard Stern and comedy. I listen to a lot of comedy during the day on Sirius Radio. Uh, a couple people in the shop. When I say a couple people, is usually my assistant, my girlfriend, and some other people that uh, share my shop. Everyone seems to be okay with comedy. You know, there's always like a group of people, but most often Howard Stern, I must say, is on the radio almost all day long. And then when I've heard the show six times, I put it on country music. <laughs> Yeah, I guess if I, if I do listen to anything, it's probably uh, more podcast type stuff, more conversational things, because it's you know it's not as repetitive as, as music and stuff. I listen to NPR quite a bit too. I mean, like, well, it's funny. My Sirius Radio broke this week, and we have a new one. I just haven't connected it yet. You got to spend an hour on the telephone, and uh, so in the shop all week long, I listen to NPR because it's the only station, the only like regular radio station that is tolerable. So I listen to NPR, all the shows on NPR, like Fresh Air and. You know, all the local New York NPR shows, like news news shows. Yeah. Well, it's um, it's 10.30, and I know we got a little late start. Are you, go, are you good with going another 10 minutes or so? I can go as long as you want, yeah. I'm done. I'm good. I'm really good. Um, what everyone's... tool or equipment do you regret not buying sooner? Um, I just was looking online for one last night, uh, a cold cutting saw. They have this new technology where you can use a regular chop saw, for cutting metal blade, uh, with a, to cut metal with a regular blade without oil and without sparks. That's something I wish I would have bought sooner. And uh, I'm going to pick one up very soon. So it's a, it's called the dry cut blade. No oil and no sparks. 
So that's what I'm, that's probably going to be my next buy. Nice. I, I think for me it's the bandsaw. Um, it was one of those things that like seemed, you know, kind of the next level of stuff, and I just didn't really need it, and I didn't think I'd have any use for it. And uh, as soon as I got it, I was like, ah, oh, this is the best thing ever. I should have had this all along. <laughs> Yeah, you got I'm telling you, there's so many. I say so many people when they ask me where can I get a bandsaw. Look on Craigslist. There's so many bandsaws that are out there. I look on Craigslist all the time. I have three bandsaws in my upstate house, and I got two down here. And uh, I, I most recently bought that brand new one that was in the make video where I made a bandsaw stand. And I bought that to bring to make it fair. I needed something that I can carry a little bit more easily than the big, the big one. But I see on Craigslist all the time the best bandsaw to buy would be an old Delta. 14-inch bandsaw. They're made well. The one I started on when I was a little kid, I still have. My dad bought it at a yard sale. And uh, they're cast iron. They're heavy. They're just heavy enough to be able to be picked up, you know, with a friend. They're not the giant ones that are really too heavy. And they're still made well enough where you could adjust all the, the guides and everything. So look for an old 14-inch Delta Rockwell bandsaw. They've been made the same since the 1940s. And uh, even up till now, if you buy one, Lowe's carries them. You know, they're about seven hundred dollars new, but you can get a, a really good one for two hundred bucks or less. I know it. I see them all the time. I, and I'm always, if I'm driving from here to Kentucky, I look on Craigslist all the way from here to Kentucky. I look at all the the, the cities along the way to see what's out there. I'm yeah. crazy, like. Yeah, that's that's good thinking. Doing it while you're traveling. Now, yeah. if you have multiple saws, like I mean, I know you have multiple saws of a lot of things. Um, if yeah. you have. You know, two bandsaws, do you keep them set up for different things, or is it just kind of... Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have a big resaw blade on one, and uh, I have a fine eighth-inch bandsaw blade on the other. Definitely. It's, you know, that's the best way to do it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see, both. Jimmy mentioned Matthias, Steve, and Chuck as shows he liked. Would you recommend... Who would you recommend as channels we should start watching? Uh, Frank Hallworth is amazing. He's uh, you know he's a, he's a good creator and a good thinker and uh, and uh, obviously an amazing filmmaker. Uh, Frank Hallworth. Uh, who else do I watch? I, I got into Izzy lately. Izzy Swan. I love his jigs are insane. Jody. Who Jody. Oh, Jody from uh, Welding Tips and Tricks. He's amazing. And uh, I know he likes my videos, which has really impressed me because I've been watching him for a long time. You know, for technical welding ability. Welding tips and tricks. Um, I don't know. I find new people all the time. David is an incredible resource. David, thank you for what you do. Uh, the, the Friday Weekly Wrap-Up is amazing to introduce everybody in the world to something new. I, I, I've learned so many new makers simply by watching that. and uh, you know, I thank him all the time. And, uh, thank you again. Yeah. I, I would totally agree with Frank and Izzy both. They're just... They're just out front, you know, as far as the creativity of what they do. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and then there's this guy named Jimmy Duresta who's really good. He does, like, all sorts of different stuff. You know, check his channel out. I try and keep it fresh. <laughs> I try. <laughs> I try. Um, let's see. Jimmy, have you considered doing a bit more speaking in your videos, or are you set with the fast-forward, no-talking approach? Um, I will eventually, uh, hopefully, uh, I'll be able to reserve that for television so they can pay me for some reason or another, but... Um, that was my concept in the beginning, is that I was only going to talk when somebody paid me, but uh, I'm, I'm kind of letting that slip a little bit. My tips, my technical tips in this little book, I'm going to uh, talk in all of these videos, of course, because I'm going to have to give some real physical, conversational in instructions. Um, but when it's appropriate, I'll talk. Honestly, I, I love telling the story without talking at all, and it it's a challenge to me, but uh, it it's... It's a puzzle that's, that I try and figure out every time I make a video, and I like solving that puzzle. Nice. Uh, here's one. Will you guys be at the Chattanooga Mini Maker Fair? I won't, but I will be at the Atlanta Maker Fair in October, and I'm actually going to have a booth set up and stuff, and I'm going to be doing some CNC and possibly some screen printing and uh, probably making some clocks live on there. And uh, I assume you're not going to be at the Chattanooga one, but you're going to be at New York? I'll be at the New York Maker Fair next month, yeah, for sure. Um, either I'll have all my stuff set up or I'll have a bandsaw like I did the last couple of years. And I had a bandsaw set up and people just walk up and say, make a this and make a that, and I just try and freestyle it. It's actually a, a real good challenge for me. I, I can't, a little kid will walk up and they say, make a butterfly. And so I just whip up a butterfly on the bandsaw freestyle out of MDF. 
And uh, it was a lot of fun. So I did that all day long, just making things on the band song. That's awesome. And you, you've been to several maker fairs, I assume, right? Yeah, I've been to California about three times in a row. I missed it this year, and that was just because I had to finish my kitchen. And the reason I needed to finish my kitchen is because my house upstate, we have rentals. We rent the house on weekends, and we had a Memorial Day party coming in, and the kitchen was not ready. So I had to get the kitchen ready. And uh, so I had to get that ready. <laughs> and we had other things to do right after that party. So anyway, uh, I've been to New York now. If I come to this in New York, it'll be 11 was my first one. So 11, 12, 11, 12 13, 14. This will be my fourth year in a row in New York. Nice. I need to make it up to that one. Maybe we can meet up up there sometime. Yeah, of course. Let's see. Jimmy, do you still go to the flea market? This is I do. I don't go to the uh, flea market that we shot the show at. And uh, I actually, I just recently went to, they own several different lots in the city, and I went to one of their lots a couple weeks ago just to kind of see what was going on. But I don't go to the 30, the 40, the 39th Street lot. I just, I haven't been there in a while. Um, there's, uh, we had, I went to the flea market for a few years after the show, but the, the person who ran the flea market was a good friend of mine, and he no longer works with the owner of that market anymore, so because he's not there, I don't go anymore, because he was my friend and my connection to that lot, um, so I don't go there anymore. Uh, when we did flea markets all over Long Island, my brother and I, when we were younger, we did Aqueduct Raceway, we did Belmont Flea Market, we did Roosevelt Raceway. These are all spots that have big, giant parking lots. And we used to sell handmade signs, and that's what we did most of. But when the concept for the show came out, uh, it was our idea to just make stuff and sell it at the flea market on the show strictly from the garbage. So we were going to make things out of the garbage. But when the network got involved, they were a little bit more nervous that we weren't going to deliver good episodes, just strictly made things out of the garbage, so they're the ones that kind of encourage us to go to like other garage sales and flea markets and find fodder to make into other things. But uh, the original the original intention was really just to find stuff straight out of the garbage and make money from zero, which, you know, it's still a good show idea, which when we have a network that has balls, we'll, we'll go that way. There I said it, I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, yeah, everybody knows now. So, no, it's um, just that, that's the type of show I'm just going to make on my own, you know, which is what we began to do. And then the the, pie, the first episode we made on our own was was the way to, that we ended up selling the concept. Um, let's see, Jimmy, I really like that you use limited amount of tools in your projects. Is that by design? And can I drop by your shop in the Lower East Side sometime? Uh, yeah, my shop's open to anybody that wants to come by. Um, I'd be happy to show you around. It's you know it takes about one second to look at everything. <laughs> it's pretty much what you see in the video. <laughs> uh, it's most of my activity happens in that one room. Um, I don't necessarily limit it. I, I'm always looking for interesting tools to use in the videos. That's why if you follow my pub, if you follow my my media, uh, you'll notice that I just recently bought a hundred year old power hacksaw, which eventually once I get it fixed up and operating. Smoothly, I'm going to use that in a video. So I always try and find cool tools to use in videos, and uh, it, it's it just gives the video more texture. And I and I love old tools, so that's the other main reason I like that as well. Yeah, it seems like a perfect excuse. The videos are a perfect excuse for collecting old tools. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Uh, you know, my printing press was like the first really big tool that I, that, I, that I thought, oh, wow, this would be great for a video. Um, and the printing press is operational. I just haven't made a printing plate for it, which every day I say, oh, yeah, don't forget you got to make a printing plate. It's literally on my, like, long list of to-do. I'm going to CNC a printing plate and then print something on the printer one right. of these days before the cold sets in again. Yeah. Yeah, I should make uh, let's see. This one's to me, but I, I have a related question for you. Bob, what 3D printer did, did you get? I'm planning on getting one. I got, um, it's called Delta Printer, and it was a Kickstarter earlier in the year. And um, a lot of the 3D printers, you know, are, are kind of XY based. You know, it's just like two side pieces and a gantry that moves across it and then it prints that way. Um, this style is called a Delta style, and there's three towers and the print head floats in between those towers and it's connected to each tower. And so as it prints, 
those arms are moving up and down, and the whole print head moves up. So it's just a different style. I saw of, that. Uh, I saw that one. Yeah, pretty, pretty well. Pretty well. Yeah, so I got that one coming. Um, and so my related question to you, Jimmy, is, you know, do you have interest in three D printing? Do you think you would have a use for it? Have you looked into it? Um, um, my friend at South friend at Westchester High has a three D printer. Probably gonna be the first one I experiment with. First one I experiment with. So offering it to me, but at the moment I don't really have a, I don't really have a three D printer. Um, because if I make something on a three, because if I make something on a three, it's kind of more like toys. It's kind of more like toys. I've, I've been out of that. I sold one. Out of that. Toys. I'm getting feedback again. I'm getting feedback again. Yeah, me too. Um. Anyway, so. Anyway, so. I don't really have. I don't really have. I have a need for three D. I have a need for three D. If I if I was in the toy, exactly. if I was in the toy, and uh, I don't mean that as a put down toy. I don't mean that as a put down toy. I was constantly making things out of uh, styrene and molding them and making like little car bodies and stuff. That was a different uh, world for me, which I'm not in anymore. Uh, I made more like the furniture, heavy building stuff. So more often for me, um, I like the uh, reductive qualities of a CNC router because I can make signage. And, uh, you know, like tonight, I was able to see the CNC and uh, you know stuff like that. I, I both use my CNCs for lettering. So I, I just wouldn't have to use it. Yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, since we are getting uh, more feedback, we may want to go ahead and, and end it for tonight, but I really appreciate you taking the time, and I know everybody asked questions. Really appreciate it, and I uh, hope that you'll do it again sometime and we can get to the rest of the questions. Wait, I just I got... <laughs> I see my friend Tim is asking me. Taylor, can you bring me your boots that you made? Oh, Tim. Oh, Tim. Tim right. is a maker. She doesn't really like being on camera. Bring me your boots, Ben. Are you coming? She's coming. Hold on. Um, <laughs> am I holding you up? Up. Here she comes. Here she comes. your boots. <laughs> She's smiling behind. You want to look? You want to come in? Uh, these uh, are the boots that are made in Guthrie, Oklahoma, at the Soros shop. And my girlfriend Taylor made these by hand. This is one of a pair. And uh, Lisa Sorrell's a bootmaker in Duffy, Oklahoma, that offers one-on-one -on -one comprehensive classes. And Taylor took her class last year. And so another thing we're constantly looking for all is bootmaking equipment. Oh, that's it. Nice. All right, well, um, thanks again, and I hope that we can do this again sometime. Hope you'll come back. Uh, anytime. If you want to do this every couple of weeks, I'm totally down. I love doing this. Cool. All right. Well, um, thanks everybody for watching, and um, hopefully I'll be able to clean up some of the audio for this. Sorry that we had some problems, uh, but you know, do what we can. It's live, so that's the way it goes. Right on. Thank you, Bob, so much, and thanks for what you do. And David and everybody out there for inspiration all around. I get inspiration from YouTube from everybody that throws their hat into this pot. Thank you. Awesome. Likewise. All right, everybody. Have a good night, and uh, we'll see you later. Peace.